Philippians chapter 1, uh, we um, have been reading here, dealing with chapter 1, and it, it seems, while well, not doesn't seem, it is, uh, that Paul, although in prison, is not turning the intention on himself. He is turning the attention, notice, on the other saints. He's turning his attention on the gospel. But most importantly, he's turning his attention on Christ. Uh, if we go, I know we've already dealt with those verses, but for sake of background, we'll begin, if you would, in verse 12, and we'll read down and deal with three more verses this morning. But notice Philippians chapter 1, verse number 12. The Bible says, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all of the palace and in all of the places. And many of the brethren, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of contention, uh, even of uh, envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice." Notice verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I want to turn your attention, if you would please, to verse number 20. Once again, we see notice in the middle of the verse. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. I want to preach this morning on this thought, Christ shall be magnified. Christ shall be magnified. Now again, we understand Paul's situation here. Uh, Paul's in prison at Rome. It is quite remarkable that Paul is, throughout this epistle, is not really drawing attention upon himself. He speaks of his situation, but notice he, you know, when people try to draw attention on things, uh, they emphasize many times the wrong things. Uh, Paul, this is not, this letter is not a pity party from Paul. Far from it. Uh, notice in verse 12, if we really we dealt with that last week, he says, Look, I, I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. But you see, he changes the focus from his persecution, his imprisonment, and says, Whoa, 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 wait, it's about the gospel. Uh, so he turns the attention and the, uh, really the, if you would, the persecution that he was enduring and says this has been for the benefit of the gospel. We have to realize that in every circumstances of life, we can either draw attention on ourselves or we can turn our attention and people's attention on the Lord. And I believe as believers with all of my heart that our life is about the Lord. And therefore, anything and everything that happens in our lives, the attention must be turned towards the Lord. Now, in dealing with these three verses here, the Apostle Paul obviously has just talked about the circumstances, and he says, look, don't feel bad for me. Uh, don't uh, uh, Notice here, he never asks. He never asks for him to be, uh, uh, look, can you pray that I'm out of jail? Uh, he doesn't pray for that. He prays, he began in the beginning of the chapter, he said, look, I'm praying for you. Well, wait a minute, you're in jail, Paul. Yes, but I'm praying for you. And then he talks about how Christ has been lifted up, and he talks about how the gospel has been able to, uh, to go and has been known in all of the palace. Now think about that for just a moment. He says, look, my imprisonment has been beneficial so that the soldiers of Caesar who's imprisoned me have been saved. 
At the end, he greets those that are, uh, that are from Rome, those that were uh, centurions, those that were part of Caesar's army. And so think about it. He says, look, this has been for the benefit of the gospel. Uh, the, 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 the book of Philippians is about this. It's about joy. It's about rejoicing. And we see at the beginning of the chapter what this is all rooted in. It's in Christ. When Jesus Christ spoke to His disciples, He says that my joy might remain in you, and so that your joy might be full. We're talking here about the joy of the Lord. We're talking about a joy, as we've been talking, I mentioned a little bit on, on Wednesday, that it is a joy that is not attached to circumstances. This type of joy and rejoicing is not attached to circumstances at all. This joy is attached to Christ Himself. And really, that's what Paul's life is all about. Now, I want us to focus here on these words because Paul said that he wanted now for Christ to be magnified in his body. Now, we're going to get here to this, but I want us to examine these three verses. By starting off with this in verse 19, we see, first of all, uh, Paul's disposition, or if you would, his direction. The Bible says this, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, I want us to think about Paul's direction because we know that Paul was a man at the end of the chapter. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul was a happy man. Paul was a man that was filled with the joy of the Lord. He was a man that was able to rejoice even though he was facing bad circumstances. Now, if anybody knew about that, it would be the church at Philippi. Why? Because part of that church at Philippi was this Roman guard, the prison guard. Remember that God saved and his whole family, and now he's part of the church. He greets them. If anybody knew that what Paul was like in jail, it was that Roman soldier. Why? Because he heard Paul sing. Uh, he heard uh, Paul uh, uh, talk about the Lord, and uh, we saw him getting saved, and what a transformation happened in his life. And so as Paul is writing about that, this is not fake, this is real, and the people at Philippi know that. But at his, his direction, because of the circumstances, we see first of all, he looked at his situation as preordained. Uh, in other words, his imprisonment, his circumstances that he finds himself, uh, he looked at that situation as preordained. Notice he says this, For I know that this, what's the this? His imprisonment. The fact that the gospel has been able to go forward, that this, notice, shall turn to my salvation, now he says, through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now this here, salvation, it means deliverance. I do not believe because of the context it is referring to a physical deliverance. He's not asking for him to pray for him to go out of jail. He's not asking for them to pray that he, got, that he gets saved. He's asking for a deliverance that he would rise above the circumstances. What I mean by that is many times people get captivated or uh, are become prisoners of the moments. And many times people, because of their circumstances, they become defeated, discouraged, and as a result, they quit on God. But the Apostle Paul says, I am not going to allow the situation to, uh, to allow me to be defeated, uh, but I'm going to allow the situation, I see the situation as preordained. God ordained this. Now we know that because he just said that my imprisonment has caused many people to get saved. My imprisonment has caused the gospel to go forth with power and has been known. And so look, I rejoice in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to understand as believers that nothing in our lives happens that God doesn't know about and nothing happens in our lives that God has not allowed. Now, there are certain things according to the word of God that we bring upon ourselves because of our sin. We understand that. But there are things in our lives that happen because God ordains it for His glory. This is Paul recognizing that his situation was preordained because he says this, and for I know. Now that sounds pretty confident, doesn't it? 
Uh, sometimes people like to be confident and say, well, I know that this is going to happen. And sometimes they may not be so sure. But here this is a surety. For example, the Apostle Paul also said, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. You see, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, and we know. Many times we quote that verse and we forget the, we forget the most important part. And we know that all things work together. You see, the Apostle Paul says here, I know that this situation, my imprisonment, shall turn. That means it shall be beneficial for my deliverance. Now he talks later about, notice in verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I would not. So what does he want to be delivered from? He wants to be delivered from a life of the flesh. It is very easy for us to get carried away when bad circumstances and bad situation happens in our lives to start begin to live the life of the flesh. And not of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's what he notice. How do we know that this is not talking about physical deliverance or, or, or a salvation? Because of this, because he says, I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers. Notice, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. What is he wanting? He wants the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want physical deliverance. He doesn't want salvation from sin. He's already got that. What he wants is the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You see, but if we do not uh, have the right direction or disposition, when we don't see our situation as preordained, then many times we get into those stages as the Apostle Paul is trying to comfort those Christians that perhaps they were discouraged at, Roman, uh, at, uh, at uh, Paul's imprisonment. And Paul says, look, it's been for the benefit of the gospel. He says, look, my, he says that my bonds, in verse 13, in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You see, my imprisonment has not just been for me being able to deliver the gospel, but many people have looked at my imprisonment and they've been emboldened to give the gospel. All of this has worked out quite well, he says. Why? Because it was preordained. You see, that's his direction. That's his disposition. You see, the situation was preordained. But number two, we see the saints were praying. How can we remain cheerful, joyful, and happy in the midst of bad situations? Because we have a different perspective, as the Apostle Paul did. But notice what helps with this perspective is not just having the right perspective and seeing the situation as preordained, but knowing here that Paul, the saints, are praying for him. So you see what he's saying here? He's saying, don't pray for the wrong thing. What's the wrong thing? Look, to be honest with you, if I hadn't been in prison, these people hadn't, wouldn't have gotten saved. If I hadn't been in prison, many of those people wouldn't have gotten bold in the Lord to preach the gospel. If I hadn't I'd been in prison, many of those things that you have seen happen would not have happened. And so make sure that you're praying for the right thing. What's the right thing to pray for? Well, I think it's this, the will of God. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the example of that. When He, when he says, oh, Father, not my will, but thine be done. We pray and we beseech God, but ultimately what we ought to say is, your will be done. May the will of God be done. And here the Apostle Paul is simply saying that, look, this shall turn to my salvation. I'm going to be able to continue to have the right direction, to have the right disposition towards the work of the Lord if you continue to pray for me in that way. So not only the situation was preordained, the saints were praying, but number three, the Spirit would be provided. You see, he says this, not only through your prayer, but also notice through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, uh, notice we know based upon the Word of God that when a person gets saved, they receive all of God that they will ever get. Uh, the Bible says that when we get saved, uh, we become the temples of God. He comes and the Holy Ghost indwells the believer at the moment of salvation. And we see that uh, the, the Holy Ghost works in us uh, and uh, he, all of Him, the, God, uh, the, the, the presence of God is in us. Now we understand that, biblically speaking. But the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, uh, notice, is a, is a yielding to God. It is not really us having more of God, it is God having more of us. 
It is not uh, us saying, well, I've got to get a little, a little bigger dose of God, if you would. No, no, no. I've got to yield myself completely to God. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So he says, don't be out of control and controlled by something else but the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit. Be ta- let your body be completely taken by the control of the Spirit of God. So, His direction and disposition is a result of the uh, seeing the situation was preordained, is a result of the saints that were praying, and is a result of the, the Spirit that is, would be provided. We not only see His direction or His dis- disposition, but number two, we see his desire. Notice here verse 20, he says this. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Now notice here, because this situation was preordained, Because the saints were praying, because the Spirit would be provided and supplied, Paul expected God to keep working through him. Paul expected God, if you would, to be magnified in the life of Paul. Uh, Paul expected God to continue to do the work that he's been doing for the benefit of the gospel, for the glory of God, to continue in this imprisonment. Why? Because, look, he's got the right perspective. The saints are praying. The the Spirit is being supplied. And when that happens, nothing can stop the work of God. So, he says this, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. Now think about it, the expectation is a complete covenant expecting God to work. Uh, waiting for uh, God to do something in the situation. Uh, Paul has already recounted, look, he's, God's done this through my imprisonment, he's done this, he's done this, and he's listed those things. And he says, look, God is still at work, he's not dead, he's still alive, and he's still at work. And so therefore, according to my earnest expectation, I expect God, and notice here the focal point is, to be magnified. I expect the Lord Jesus Christ to be lifted up. I expect Him to increase... He says, my earnest expectation and my hope. The word hope here is not just like we use it today. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. It's been raining a lot lately. Not that type of hope. This hope means confidence. His confidence. Proverbs 10.28 tells us, The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. You see, the hope of the righteous shall be gladness. The confidence of the righteous, if you would, shall be gladness. But the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Now notice he says this. For my earnest expectation and my hope, notice, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Now, the word ashamed means to be dishonored. To be a dishonor. To be a disgrace. To make someone ashamed. In other words, Paul did not want to dishonor the name of Christ. He expects God to work. Do you see here how kind of his desire in his heart? Based upon his perspective, look, the saints are praying, the supply of the Spirit is going to come in. Well, here's my desire. I expect God to do something. I have complete confidence that God is going to be magnified because He is at work. And what I dread, what I do not desire, is for me to get to the place where I am ashamed, where I dishonor the name of God, where I do not magnify the the, the, the name of the Lord, but where I bring shame to His name. I don't want that to happen. 1 Peter 4.16 says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You know, the Apostle Paul says, I, I, I do not want to be cast away. I, I want to be faithful to God. I, I don't want to do anything in my life that would bring shame to the name of Christ. Now, based upon the context, notice those previous verses. Where we bring shame to the name of Christ is when we get to the place where we look at our situation as not preordained. 
uh, just bad things. Bad things happen to me all the time. That's just the way my life, and my life is just miserable, and oh, look at all my life, and all of the things that happen to me. Oh, wait, well, you're missing it. You're, you're missing it. The situations are preordained, and there's no way, and what happens in our lives is we bring shame to the name of Christ, because people look at it this way and say, I don't see God working in your life. Seems like you're defeated. Where's your God that you talk about? You worship and you sing about God and you talk about God, uh, but then you're depressed about your life. Uh, what's going on there? Uh, you see, uh, we also see that the, the prayer of the saints, uh, they were praying for the Apostle Paul, the right type of prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You see, if we do not have the help of God as we see our situations preordained, uh, and if we do not live yielded to the Spirit of God, then we will bring shame to the name of Christ. I mean, you see the Apostle Paul. I mean, to me, the Apostle Paul, it is clear in the Word of God, was a weak, frail man. He came and he preached in weakness, uh, but he came in the power of God. But I guarantee you, if you went to go visit Paul in his cell, he would greet you, have a smile on his face, and he would be rejoicing in the Lord. And I guarantee you it would be this way. You would probably go to prison to try to encourage Paul, but you would leave encouraged by Paul. That's just the kind of man he was. the way he looked at his situations. The prayer of the saints. The supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You see, he was not the type of man that you would come, and many times as Christians, uh, we get defeated, and you come in prison, and uh, people, <laughs> instead of we going in to encourage someone and being encouraged by that person, we try to encourage someone, and we leave discouraged. <laughs> because... Uh, it's just my, uh, my life is so bad, and everything's uh, going wrong, and... Every single person in the world, including Christians, are going to go through difficult times. Every single one. No one is exempt from it. Don't listen to the preachers that says, oh, you commit your life to Christ and everything will be fine. Peach and roses. No, it's not. Life is life. God is not so much interested in making us a smooth path. God is interested in walking with us on a bad path. Why? Because the world doesn't have God, but the Christian does, or should, uh, should live with God, and that life is different. And so the Apostle Paul said, Look, I, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, notice, but that with all boldness, all boldness, notice, as always. <laughs> to be bold means uh, basically to have the freedom to speak. In other words, to not be hindered by the circumstances. And what happens here, he's not talking about being bold towards just talking to other people and having conversation. He's talking about being bold for Christ. He's talking about being bold to proclaim the gospel message. He's talking about boldness to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. He's talking about boldness to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not talking about, uh, well, I can't talk to anybody. No, he's talking about specifically boldness for the Lord. Notice, uh, that, uh, but that with all boldness, notice, as always. Now, look, he expects God to do something. He hopes, he's got confidence in God. Look, he doesn't want to be ashamed. He doesn't want to be an outcast. But he wants to, with all boldness. And then he says, as always. What does that mean? It means this. That means in every season of life, in every situation, Whenever I take a stand. You see, I want to be bold. I want to expect God to do something, not just when everything is going peaches and roses. I want to be bold and I want to expect God and have confidence that God is going to do something even in a bad season of life. Even when the situation is not going well. Even when I take a stand and guess what? Some people sometimes get saved and sometimes I get stoned. That's okay. In every situation, as always, whether it's well, whether it's not well, I want Christ to be magnified. That was his desire. That was his passion. And then he says this, that with all boldness, as always, notice, so now also. So, just so you don't miss it, every season of life, and that includes believer, you listen to me to the church at Philippi, that includes now. 
Yes, now while I'm in prison, in prison. You see, this present situation for Paul would either end up in life or death. That's what he says here in this verse. He knew that. My present situation is either going to end in life or death. There was only two possible outcomes to the current situation. Paul did not, did not know which would happen. But regardless, he was ready for it. You see that? Regardless of whether it was life or death, he was ready for it. Since it meant that Christ would be magnified. You see what he says? Look, I'm confident because God's going to do something. But I know this for sure. If I die, Christ is going to be magnified. If I live, Christ is going to be magnified. Whoa, that's a total different way to live. You see, where God is the chief orchestrator of our lives, or no, 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 i got to be in control. And the fact of the matter is, if, this, if living is the outcome, then Christ is magnified. But if death is the outcome, then Christ cannot be magnified. And the Apostle Paul says, yes, he is. Whatever the outcome. You see, I have boldness. I expect. I have confidence. As always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified. And by the way, it's whether life or death. So just so you know, church at Philippi, whether life or death, Christ is going to be magnified. Mark my words, He is going to be magnified. You say, what does magnify mean? It means this, to increase, to extol, to enlarge, to show someone great. So do you mean the Apostle Paul, that if you die, that would, uh, that would increase God? That would enlarge God? Uh, that would uh, show Him great? Yes! And so you mean to me, even in your life, uh, that if you live and are able to get out of prison, that God would increase, He would be extolled, He would be enlarged, He would be shown great, He would be magnified? Yes, in both cases. You see, you always magnify you always magnify, we always magnify what is important to us. We always increase things in our lives that we deem important. We always enlarge areas of our lives that we deem important. We always show great the areas of our lives that we deem important. I think we can come away with this first. We understand that the most important thing to Paul was Christ. Consider the, the difference between Saul in the Old Testament and David. Remember when Saul was confronted by his sin? He said, okay, I, okay I, I'll repent now, but look, Samuel, honor me in front of all the people uh, so that I may worship the Lord thy God. You see, Saul was concerned with his own name when confronted by sin. I got a reputation, and uh, Samuel, would you just honor me in front of all the people? Uh, would you just make sure that everybody knows that I'm okay? But then David sinned, and I, by the way, I think that David's sin, humanly speaking, sin is sin in the sight of God, was a whole lot worse by adultery and murder and all those things. And the consequences were great, but David was not concerned with his own name. He was concerned with God's name. We saw that at the beginning. Remember when he went to fight against Goliath? <laughs> The, the phrase that he said uh, was, he said this as he faced Goliath. He says, look, I, I'm not coming to you uh, with my power and with sword. I'm coming to you because I want all of the world to know that there is a God in Israel. That's my desire. I, I want God to be magnified. It's about God. And didn't he say in the Psalm of Repentance, he says that after his repentance, then shall I cease transgressors thy ways? Then shall sinners be converted unto thee? You see, the apostle, or the apostle David, David uh, had a desire to increase, to magnify, to extol, to enlarge, to show how great the name of God was. And Saul was concerned with his own name. John the Baptist. His famous sentence, if you were to phrase, if you go to uh, John chapter 3, uh, people were kind of talking about to John, and he was baptizing. And by the way, John the, the, uh, John the Baptist had a great following. Uh, but notice here what happens in John chapter 3, verse 22. The Bible says, after 
These things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in uh, Anon near, uh, near to Salem, uh, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying, and they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all the men come to him. John, you're losing some crowd here. There's more people now going to follow Jesus than following you. There's a problem, John. What do you say? John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy thereof is full. Look, here's the, here it is. He must increase. But I must decrease. John the Baptist says he must be magnified. He must be magnified. I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. This is not about me. This is about Christ. And John the Baptist says, look, he must increase, he must be magnified, he must be enlarged, he must be increased, he must be extolled, he must become great, but I must decrease. And Paul, in the same way, wanted Christ to be magnified in his body. Now, I believe it's important because it's not just about magnifying the Lord with our voices. It's about magnifying him with our bodies. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about in the body is where there is weakness. In the body is where there is infirmities. In the body is where we feel stress. In the body is where there is pain that's felt. It is all part of the body. This is the area that Paul wanted Christ to be magnified. In his, but you, do you see here what he's saying? In his body. He's not just saying, look, let's get it together and let's magnify, let's sing songs to magnify the Lord. No, he says, I want mag the Lord to be magnified in my body. You going through a weakness, Paul? Yep. It's in order for Christ to be magnified. You going through an infirmity, Paul? Yes, it's for Christ to be magnified. Are you stressed out, Paul? Yep, I want Christ to be magnified. Are you hurt, Paul? Yeah, I want Christ to be magnified. You see, everything that happens in my life, my desire is for Christ to be magnified. Why? Why in the body? Well, the body is what people see. It's the outside, the physical. People do not see the spirit and the soul. But they do see the body. They see the, the body. They see the outward man. And therefore, as they see people's uh, weaknesses and infirmities and stresses and, and pains, and they see that in their bodies they have a desire to magnify the Lord, and then He is magnified. Why? Because of their bodies are a display of Christ being increased and extolled and enlarged and shown great. Paul put it this way. He says, God told me when I asked for him to remove my infirmity. God says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength shall be perfect in weakness. What, was he, what kind of time of weakness he was talking about? Physical weakness. He had an infirmity. Now whether he was half blind or whatever the infirmity was, there's debate about that. But, but the fact is, it was a physical infirmity. And he said that the strength of God would be revealed is in his infirmity, in his weakness. When someone is going through a physical pain and they show up at church, you know what happens? Christ is magnified. When someone is going through a heartache and they show up at church, you know what happens? Christ is magnified. 
When someone is going through a trial in their lives and they still get up and read their Bible and pray to God, who's magnified? Christ is magnified. Why? Because in their weakness, as they see themselves and their bodies and because of their infirmities and their stresses and all the things that they're facing, as they see themselves shrivel up, everybody can see now more of God than ever before. You see, he wants Christ to be magnified in his body. It's one thing to say things. It's another way to, it's another thing to see things. You see, because the Apostle Paul was not just singing when people were around. He was singing when there was nobody else to listen to. So guess what? When somebody hears a song in the jail, in the jailhouse, ah, that's Paul. <laughs> that's Paul. He's just rejoicing in the Lord. He's just having a, you know, a, a, a praise service. <laughs> He's just having a good time with the Lord. His body. You see, we see his direction, his disposition. We see his desire, but thirdly, we see his devotion. He, he, he kind of says this to sum up. He says this. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I want to notice, first of all, that this was personal. See what the Apostle Paul says? I, I said, I don't know about you, but for me, for to me, to me, to live is Christ. Now, there's much in the Scripture that speaks of that. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 14, 7, For none of us liveth to himself. None of us liveth to himself. And, by the way, no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that He might be Lord both of the dead and the living. 2 Corinthians 5.14, the Apostle Paul wrote, said, For the love of Christ constraineth me, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we're not living this life unto ourselves. We are living this life really to magnify the Lord in our bodies. When God brings things in our lives, have we ever thought that it's for other people around us to see Christ better than ever before? So I look at this verse, for to me to live is Christ. His life was about Christ. But then he says this, and to die is gain. Now, let me say this, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. What could be more gain than Christ? For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Christ is everything. We have Him. He indwells us. So how could death be gain? What can be more than Christ? Or what, uh, what is better, what could be gain than living for Christ? Well, it's simply this. More Christ. <laughs> more Christ. For to me to live is Christ, right now it is Christ, but to die is gain. It's more Christ. And by the way, when we die, we're going to be like Him. Can I say, that's more Christ? <laughs> now we right now want to have the image of Jesus Christ uh, uh, shown in us, revealed in us. We want the image of Christ, to, we want our lives to be uh, molded and shaped into the image of Christ. But one day, it's going to be gain. Right now, we live for Christ. Uh, we live our lives as unto the Lord. But one day, it's going to be gain. Why? Because it's going to be more Christ. Why? Because we're going to be like Him. And of course it's going to be gain. Why? Because there will be more Christ in us than ever before. So the question I want to ask this morning, is Christ magnified in our bodies? 
the Apostle Paul says this, says this, So now also Christ, notice what he says, shall be magnified. Shall be. This is pre-death. He's going to die in the Roman prison. He's going to die. But pre-death, he says this. Now, he didn't know at that time whether life or death. But he says this. But if death, Christ is going to be magnified. He is going to be magnified. And if I get to live a little longer, he is going to be magnified. Would to God that as believers we had that desire that Paul had, that devotion for the Lord. So whatever happens in my life, may Christ be magnified. I want, I, I want, as John the Baptist, he must increase. I want God to be enlarged in my life. I want God to be extolled. I want more of God in my life. And you know, if I die, then it'll be even more. <laughs> more gain. It'll be gain. More Christ. Let's ask the Lord to help us to have more Christ in us.